Some of you don't like CSS, and you have pretty good reasons to hate it. My name is Shimon, and I like CSS. I could even say something controversial because I, I say that I love CSS, and I know this isn't a popular statement nowadays, but I do also realize that sometimes styling is hard and messy. Sometimes we need to do inline styles, sometimes we need to do important overrides, and all of that makes us unhappy, and our styles leak out to the templates, and everything is just a mess. So what I'll be talking about today is essentially maybe a different kind of approach to styling, one which solves all of those issues and also opens up the doors to many powerful UI components. But before I talk about the interesting things, I talk about how things usually look like. Because in our daily work, things are usually static. And by static, I mean that the styles we define don't change. We know every single state of a component. Let's say a designer created some designs for us, so we map all that out, we create a component, create all the different classes based on some props, pick them, and that's it. That's a solved problem. And an example of that would be a good old button. And don't worry, I won't be talking about buttons for long. Um, but buttons can be quite customizable. You can have different sizes, you might have different colors, you might have different rounded borders, different border sizes, and the colors might have outlined variants. So that's quite a bit of customization. And the truth is, it's very simple, and the problem is solved. What you do is create a component, map out props for the different visual and properties of that component, like the size, the color, the border, and whatever. And based on those props, we just pick and choose appropriate CS classes, voila, you have a button. That works. But this approach actually gets weird when all of the different cases we want to map and define are, well, so many. And a good example of that would be grid systems. Because how usually those grid systems are solved is that, well, you have a lot of classes. You have a class for a container, for a row, and for columns, we define every single possibility, which is a lot. Because grid systems give you a certain basis you work on, like 12 columns, and you define columns of different proportions, like one quarter, half, third, five twelfths, whatever. And you need classes for all of that because, well, we don't want to do inline styles, right? So that's a lot of CSS. And then you add helpers to that for column offsets and positioning the columns around. And then you want to add the actual important feature, which is responsiveness. So you need to multiply all of that by the amount of media queries. So our grids can be responsive. And the, usual, the result of that is a beautiful thing like this. And imagine you have like a thousand or more lines like this complicated grid systems, maybe close to 20 kilobytes of CSS, and that's not really ideal. Because if you'd ask someone who doesn't write CSS and let them see that, they would be probably like, um, are you guys fine there? Because that's like a lot of repetition. That doesn't really look nice, because as you can see, all of those values are pre-computed. Why don't you just compute it? And we would say, well, we do it because we don't want to do inline styles, so that's how it is. And we accepted it for a long time. So what I mean by dynamic UI, you might have a good hint now, is that when the styles we have are not entirely known or mapping them out, because, well, there's so many possibilities, might be hard. So imagine you want to style something and depend on mouse position. Well, generating classes for every mouse position, um, didn't do that, please. Um, but imagine something more complex, like an application like Figma. So you generate styles for that. No, you can't because, well, you can place elements there, resize them, rotate them, change the colors, borders, and everything. There is little staticness there. All of it is dynamic. You don't know what the user is going to do. So, well, that's quite hard. And to make it work, what we usually resorted to is either limit the dynamicness, or if it's low, just generate a ton of CSS with SAS in loops and just accept that, hey, we are going to have a lot of code you might not even use, or just do inline styles, which is bad. And some of you might be thinking, and because we have been accepting this state of things, that, well, inline styles are okay. You are not going to override them. They are not that much of an issue. So let me bring you up a simple example. Imagine you want to create a context menu. A context menu is a simple component because, well, you know, 
everything about it except the position where it should be displayed. So you would apply inline styles to the top and left, and you would be done with it. But let me complicate things a bit. So imagine we would want to make our, make our context menus responsive. So we might maybe want something on mobile like the thing on the right, where you now have a list of options that slides from the bottom, which is a much nicer user experience and essentially solve the same problem. You get a list of options, you need to pick one. So if you would want to address it with the approach of inline styles, we have a problem, because now we either override the inline styles with important media queries, which is bad and further complicates customizing such component by other developers, or maybe apply inline styles on some screen sizes, which is weird because now our component has to track, follow, and spy on the desktops with, which is just not what we want to do. So the question is, what can we do then, right? Because this isn't ideal and actually we've been accepting for a long time. So my answer to you is, Accept it, but not like give up right in line styles and the presentation, but actually we can define the dynamic parts in our CSS with plain old CSS features. But it might be unintuitive and this approach is not really popular for some reason. And how it works, I'll follow you through the example of a context menu. So imagine you create a context menu component, you define the props and we pass the position of like X and Y coordinates which will be the place the context menu will be displayed in. And then what we do is do inline styles, but no, not, that's not those inline styles. What we do is set inline custom CSS properties. And by the way, if you use TypeScript, if you use TypeScript it doesn't like those. It wants to, you to use just normal CSS by default, which I disagree with, and I don't like that. Um, and if you do that, what you do next is you use them, but only when you need to. So on mobile, I do the things in a normal way, like, hey, it's fixed to the bottom, cool. And on desktop, I say, OK, I'm going to use those values then. So you might be thinking, isn't it just inline styles again, with like three extra steps? Why complicate things? And the truth is, technically, they are inline styles, but not really, because the difference is, is that we are inlining custom CSS properties. So imagine you want to set any custom property to like maybe a dozen of them to every single selector of your application. And nothing would happen unless those selectors and those styles would be using those values. In which case, you are not really changing things, you are configuring and tweaking the existing behavior. So what you get is actually you have two different approaches. You either override the styles if necessary, which is the old way of doing things, and if you inline that, you get specificity issues and you are sad. And the other approach you have is configure the existing styles by passing the values to the CSS and leave the CSS alone. And the cool thing is, this is actually framework agnostic. You can use it in React, Angular, Vue, or just plain old vanilla JavaScript, but because of view and single file components, it's really nice to use because we have everything in one file and it's coupled nicely and you can see these relationships so it's much more easy to manage and the code we write is quite straightforward. So there is a good thing though because while view is good, view can actually be better. And to be more exact, Evan tweeted something in the second half of last year which was he was playing with the idea of how about we expose the properties of our component to styles just like we do in templates? And this feature actually got added in view 3.2. And what we can do is use a new expression, vbind expression in our CSS to bind some properties in our CSS. And underneath, it does pretty much the thing I showed you previously. It's the same pattern. It defines custom CSS properties, it uses them in place where you wrote the vbind expression, and then those properties are inlined to any root element of the component, and they are reactively updated. But I know you might be thinking that this isn't really that exciting because, well, I've shown you a context menu and three extra straps to do the same thing we did already, so let me try to stir up your imagination a little bit. So let's take a look at the examples and I'll start with the simple one. 
just so you can see that I'm not lying and there are no nice styles actually and no specificity issues. So as you can see on the screen, um, what I have on desktop is a simple context menu with a list of options. I can click one of those and if I'll change the screen size to be a bit more like mobile, what I get is a list of options that slides from the bottom, which is a nice experience. And the thing is, if I right click on mobile, it's also responsive, and we use the position we clicked on mobile on desktop, because there is no reason not to do that. And how it looks like in code, let me show you. So this is the context menu component. Let me go down a little bit. So as you can see, I set the props to be the x and y number coordinates. Cool. And what I do next is, well, I write my CSS as normal. On the mobile, I just have the same thing I had usually. But on desktop, below, you can see that I'm changing the properties as I usually do, with low specificity overrides, nothing fancy, no issues with that. And what I have is reactively updated properties that change and can be changed by the props. And that's pretty cool. And what I do here also is cast those numbers to pixel values because, well, um, we use numbers as properties, and CSS wants pixels. I could do this in a computed property in my component, but I'm just showing you that it can be done also in CSS. But, of course, this is not the thing I'm trying to buy you over with, because this is simple and not very exciting. So, let me show you another example, which is a dynamic table. Imagine you might have a need to create a feature, like a table, that can display any kind of data, because, well, maybe we don't know the data we are dealing with in our application, and it might have like 40 fields, 50 fields, and the user is in control of what we feel the fields we display, and what sizes are the columns, for example, the IDs are very narrow. And in this case, the user might also be maybe selecting which columns they want to see by, well, checkboxes. And all of that is also responsive. So that's another complication. And moreover, on mobile, we have a list of cards, not just rows. And you also can tweak those values and change which columns you want to see. And all of that with no inline styles, no high specificity issues. So how it's done is actually surprisingly simple. Because all I need to do is essentially um, let me just go and check the dynamic table. So all I do, and I just show you the CSS because that's really um, interesting, and <laughs> that's the only interesting part here, is that whenever I'm on tablets on a different resolution, I say, hey, I'll be using a CSS grid here. And about the template, um, I don't know. Let the JavaScript compute it, because I don't know it upfront, right? So next is in my component's logic, I have a computed property, which is just the computed template. And it's all clean, and it works fantastically. And imagine further, if you'd want to complicate this feature, this dynamic table, to maybe let the user resize the columns, drag them around with their mouse to complicate things even more, the CSS wouldn't need to change. All that would change is just the JavaScript, which is pretty interesting and cool. So, as a final example, I have, a something, I have something that I explained about earlier, that is a grid system. It, it might be a boring thing, but what I have did here, which is different than the original approach, is I approached it with this new dynamic UI approach. And what I have is all your typical features you would expect from a CSS grid. And that is, we have auto-sizing columns, and we might have, well, custom gutter, we might have columns that have fixed sizes, we might have offsets on those columns, and everything else also behaving responsively. But here is the thing that I get for free with this approach, which you want with any other existing grid system done in a traditional way. And that is, I might change the number of columns, and I don't change my CSS. And I might actually want to have two different, three different grid systems on the same page with the same CSS and behaving entirely differently. So this approach actually opens the door for quite fun new possibilities. And I don't have a thousand or more lines of CSS. I have about a hundred, which is also nice, right? So let's see how it looks like in the code. And it's actually straightforward. So for the container, 
because we have three components, just like Beautify or Bootstrap does. We have a container, a row, and a column. So the role of the container is simple. You just pass the number of columns you want your grid system to be using. I default it to 12. And I also pass the gutter size, which is 20. I compute the gutter size to be in pixels. And I, all I do is just sets named computed properties, apps named <laughs> CSS properties to my own names, which then those components will access thanks to a simple feature we had for a long time, the CSS cascade. I don't need to pass them in props, and because those components are supposed to be used together, that's perfectly fine. So let's move on to the row. And the row is even more simple. Because all it does is just uses the gutter and applies proper margins and wraps the columns in a very grid-like fashion. So the fun thing is only the column. That's, how thing, that's where things get interesting. So by default, the column is auto-sized. I only size them if I pass the props. And likewise, I only offset it when I pass the props for offset. So I have a few modifier classes, typical BAM fashion. And only then I apply this different behavior. So when it comes to the script itself, no computation here. Because all the magic actually happens in CSS. So what I do is I have two simple mixins here, because I need to reuse the styles for, well, when you size a column, or size a column on desktop or tablets, and same with the offsets. And I just define here a fun thing that for the grid, the max width of a column and the flex basis will be some percentage. I don't know what this percentage is going to be. And what I do is I compute it only on those modifier classes to be, well, the proportion of like 4 out of 12 in percentage. Cool. And now what I need to do next is just, hey, when I size a column, the size is going to be the property of size, so like maybe five. And if I override it on desktop or tablet, I just change the size property. I don't need to change any other styles. The math stays the same, it checks out. Nothing else needs to be done. The media queries are very simple. And the same thing with offsets. On desktop, you just change the size to be size desktop. On tablet, size tablet. That's really it. And that's pretty much what I get. And I also had some cool features for free. Because like I've said, you might even have like a 100 grid column. That's really OK, because the math still checks out. I don't really care. So that's up to you. And with that said, I, of course, be sharing the code and the demo. So I'll be tweeting those. And probably someone from Monterey will share them with all of you. And to just sum it all up, what we have now, essentially, is just new powerful ways to deal with styling issues. And with those, and with this approach, we can actually create very complex dynamic UI components in a very clean, manageable, and efficient way. Because that's, straight, that's really straightforward. I think I've seen there is not really that much code at all, and the examples are quite powerful. But, and I think this is most important and quite personal for me, <laughs> um, as this was the last bastion of them, and it Take, it has taken a lot of painful years, but I can finally say that, well, inline styles are finally a thing of the past. Thank you.